So good morning to everybody. So we have to continue the lesson. <clears throat> that is what we call the structural organization of cockroach. So we studied so far the morphology of cockroach, the differences between male and female cockroach. See the male cockroaches are normally having a narrow abdomen when compared to the female. The females normally have a broader abdomen. And styles are present in the case of a male cockroach, and that one is absent in the case of female cockroach. We discussed this today. Now let's go for the internal organization, the internal anatomy. The first one, the digestive system. As a general rule, normally you know that one, in all cases of animals, the digestive system consists of number one, the alimentary canal, a long tube starting with mouth, ending with anus. And for digestion, Associated with these structures, we have the glands, normally called as the digestive glands, or we can say commonly the associated glands. Those glands concerned with the digestion. Now let's take what are the components of the alimentary canal. A very simple organization. Now we have the alimentary canal is divisible into three parts: fore gut, mid gut, hind gut. The fore gut is otherwise called stomach. Forget is otherwise called stomach. Then the midget is otherwise called some mesenteron, middle part of the digestive system, mesenteron. The hindgut is also called proctodium. So normally during development, now we have formed first the proctodium. So the embryonic development, if you are observing the case of animals, see in the case of this one, here it is a protostome. It is a protostome. So classification wise we can say it is a protostome. The meaning for that one, actually the animal has blastopore. The blastopore develops into mouth. An anus is formed actually just at a later stage of development, protostome. So cockroach is a protostome. Cockroach is a protostome. And we have, though we mentioned about that one here, one structure during embryological development, blastopore, is the blastopore, blastopore. This blastopore develops into mouth first. This is one of the openings found in the embryonic stage, what is called gastrula. For an embryonic stage, what is called gastrula. Its opening is called blastopore. We studied already a classification, the protostome. Now, cockroach is also a protostome. Now we have the proctodium, mesenteron, and stomodium. The first formation is the mouth and followed by the anus. Though the mouth is formed first, we have actually the hindgut is formed first and proceeding towards the anterior head. That's why it is called as proctodium, the first formed part of the alimentary canal. This is stomodium because it is found near the mouth, stoma, the word refers to the mouth. So stomodium. The first part you have as per the alimentary canal is concerned from the anterior head foregut. The midgut, mesenteron, and the hindgut, what is called proctodium, that is forming the posterior end of the animal, the digestive part. Now, what are the components of the foregut? So it starts with the mouth. Proceeding the mouth, we have the pharynx. Then it is followed by a short esophagus. Now, the esophagus is dilated to form a crop, a sac like structure concerned with the full storage. Concerned with the full storage. It is followed by a grinding mill, a thick wall structure concerned with the grinding of food, hence called the gizzard, otherwise called proventriculus. Now, gizzard or proventriculus. Now, what is the role of the crop? So, if you have, for example, Now this is the digestive system. Now it starts with the buccal cavity, it starts with the mouth, then buccal cavity, we have what is called a short esophagus. This is the esophagus. It is followed by a dilated sac-like structure, what is called the crop. The crop is followed by, you have just this part. Now this is one. A circular structure, more or less, otherwise called proventriculus. Having an outer thick wall made up of circular muscles. On the inner side, it contains six chitinous plates. They are moving sidewise. 
for grinding the food. For example, here this is the inner structure of the gizzard. Now you see that one is rather chitinous place. So it is called as a proventriculus pro and also called we have actually that is <coughs> the grinding bit. See the black colored one represents the what we have the chitinous plates. They are six in numbers. They are moving forward and backward, causing the grinding of the foot. Hence called grinding just mill. So it has an outer circular muscle, thick muscle, internally six chitinous plates. Now the gizzard actually projects into what we call the midget in the form of a thin membranous invagination. Now this is the membranous invagination. This one, the membranous invagination. Formed not actually mainly by the gizzard. Is this other is called esophageal invagination. It is the extension of the membrane of the esophagus invaginating into the midget. And this is called what is known as stomatial wall. Stomatial wall. So the membranous projection of the esophagus into the midget is called stomatial wall to increase what we call the surface area for digestion as well as absorption. So this is what we have the gizzard outer thick circular muscle. We have the chitinous plates, six chitinous plates for grinding the food. And then we have an invagination formed by, we see that one, the esophageal membrane and that is called stomatial wall. <clears throat> now it is followed by, you see that one, this is the midget. This is the midget. Now this part is a crop. You see that one, a dilated pouch. Concerned with the storage, not for digestion. Concerned with the storage, not for digestion. The grinding occurs here. Digestion occurs in the mesenteron by the different secretions. Either from the hepatic cecum or for the intestinal glands or for the salivary glands. We have just actually salivary glands release their secretions and digestion occurs in the buccal cavity. Then we have the intestinal glands. And also the hepatic CK, I'll tell you more about that one, 6 to 8, they are present. They also help in the process of digestion. You'll see the structure. Now this is what we have, the crop and followed by a small circular or a spherical mass. That structure is called the gizzard. And at the junction of the gizzard, and then this is what we have, the midgut. This yellow colored one after this, starting from here after this one. This is what is called the midget, otherwise called the mesenteron. Now at the junction of the foregut and the midget, or at the junction of the gizzard and the mesenteron, we have six to eight filamentous structures. See that one? Blind ended tubular structures. Six to eight in number. So these structures are called hepatic CK. Six to eight hepatic C. And they are releasing some secretions. Similar to what we have, actually the pancreas and liver, concerned with what is called the digestive process. We'll see physiology of digestion later, what is the role. Now the mesenteron. So it is otherwise called as a midgut. And it is followed by the hindgut. The hindgut is divisible into ileum, then colon, and then rectum. This is that, actually, the hindgut. Somewhat slightly dilated when compared to the mesenteron. And at the junction of, you see that one, at the junction of uh, the mesenteron and hindgut, we have thin filamentous yellow colored structures nearly varying from 100 to 150. These are all the filamentous structures present at the junction of the midgut and what we call the hindgut. And these structures normally concern with excretion. They are called the malphagian tubules, thin filamentous structures. They collect the waste products from the silomic fluid, what we call the hemocyte, and put it into the digestive tract. The waste materials are eliminated through the anus. That's about what we call the malphagian tubules. Connected to the digestive system but concerned with the excretion. Connected to the digestive system and concerned with the excretion. Now we have the hindgut is being divided into three components. Ileum, then the second part colon, and the third part rectum. These are the three components of uh, hindgut. The rectum opens outside by means of anus, present at the posterior end. That is in the genital pouch of male, and similar in the case of female, at the posterior end. The anus opens also. So that's about the digestive system, what we have. I will give the notes, we see that one, this is a structure only.
The forget starting with I mentioned described through the diagram. The crop is a sack like structure. We have seen already. And this is for storing of food. What is the function of a crop? Now in the case of honeybee, another insect, where actually the synthesis of honey occurs, where the nectar from the flower is converted into honey. That is in the case of honeybee. Crop is concerned with the formation of honey. Because the animals collect the sweet fluid, what is called nectar from the flower, and the nectar gets converted into honey only in the crop, and they are being stored in the case of honeybee. And here too, normally the food is stored. It is a storage part, concerned with storage, not for digestion. Now we have the gizzard, the grinding mill. So I mentioned about it has an outer thick layer of circular muscles, and inside. Internally, it is lined with a cuticle and also six highly chitinous plates called teeth. Six highly chitinous plates called teeth. It is called grinding because it is responsible for the grinding of the food materials taken inside. With the help of the what we have there, that is chitinous plates, they are grinding the food materials. And not only acts as a grinding mill, it is also acting as a filtering device. Hence called a sieve, a filtering device, filtering the food particles, grinding and filtering. Now, uh, as mentioned here, the stomatal wall. What is stomatal wall? This is a membranous projection of this. Though it is actually continuation of the esophagus, as it is present near the gis, it is called the membranous actually projection of the gis because it is present at the level of the gis. It's a continuation of the outer membrane of is that one esophagus, hence called esophageal invagination. But not actually, that's as in the diagram it is given esophageal invagination. Truly speaking, now we have the invagination of the membrane at the level of the gis. So at the level of the gis, we have the membranous invagination. That forms what is called stomatal wall. Normally formed, that is, at the junction of a gizzard and then the mesentery. Now, what is the function of this one? It is not involved in digestive process, but prevents the backward movement of the food materials. Prevents the backward movement of the food materials from the mesenteron to the stomach, or to the crop, or to the kiss. So, this prevents the backward passage of food. And then, the entire foregut is internally lined with a cuticle. In order to give protection to the wall on the digestive tract, the foregut, here the entire foregut is internally lined with the cuticle. Now the midgut. So now the midgut actually concerned with the digestion process and it is tubular. It is also internally lined with the cuticle. Normally the cuticle is not present in any of the animals for lining what we call the digestive tract but here for giving protection to the wall internally we have a cuticular layer. Now at the junction I mentioned about, at the junction of the foregut and midgut, strictly speaking at the junction of the gizzard and the midgut, we have six to eight blind tubules, blind tubules, concerned with the secretion of some digestive juices, they are called hepatic CK, otherwise called as gastric CK, they are called hepatic CK, normally called as hepatic CK, there is also another name for that one, gastric CK. It is normally present at the junction of the foregut and mesenteron. Junction of foregut and mesenteron. So they are concerned with the secretion of, you see that one, the juice or the enzymes responsible for the digestion of the food materials. This is more or less comparable to our liver and pancreas. More or less comparable to the liver and pancreas. Don't forget this is a number. Location is very important. Where is it located? See that one, it is located at the junction of what we have that is foregut and midgut or at the junction of the gizzard and the midgut. This is the picture I show you. Now this is, though it is given esophageal invagination. This is a membranous invagination just occur after the crop. Okay, after the crop projecting into it. This one prevents the backward flow of food. This one prevents the backward flow of food. Now this is the structure what I showed you. Now the food bolus. One question also related. Now in the wall, now this is what we call the intestinal wall. 
Here there is a membrane is present which is porous in nature. This is a membrane which is porous in nature. This membrane is called peritrophic membrane. This membrane is called peritrophic membrane. This membrane is called peritrophic membrane. Lining the wall of the mesenchymal. This membrane is actually secreted by the kisser and the foot, the entire foot bolus, the mass of foot, that is called a bolus, a mass of foot, which is being surrounded and covered with peritrophic membrane. It is porous in nature. This membrane protects the wall of the mesenchymal from what we call the food materials, which are rough in nature. So, peritropic membrane is an envelope surrounding the food particles. That is what is called a mass of food, a bolus, and that is called peritropic membrane in the mesenchymal. Now, this membrane protects the wall I mentioned. Its function is protection. Absorption of food materials is taking place only through this membrane. A peritropic membrane, a porous membrane secreted by the kiss cell that covers that covers the entire foot bolus, the entire mass of foot in the mesenchymal. Function protecting the wall of what is called the mesenchymal from the foot particles. And also in the mid, mid gut, we have the absorption of foot is taking place. Even the absorption of foot is also taking place only through this membrane because the entire foot is covered by means of a membrane, the peritrophic membrane. That's why it's called peritrophic membrane, troph, the foot, the peri, the circumference. And your foot bolus is surrounded by this membrane. So function is protection as it is porous in nature. Now the foot absorption takes place mainly through this peritrophic membrane. It's not being actually broken. It is present as such unless the foot is completely what we call digested and absorbed. And again I mentioned about we have 100 to 150 yellow colored thread like structures. Hepatic CK tubular structures. These are all the filamentous structures. So nearly 100 to 150 yellow color structures are present at the junction of the mid gut and what we have the hind gut. That is the junction of the mesenteron and we can say the first part of the industrial ilium. Now what is the function? They help in the removal of these products from the silomic fluid or from the blood as the circulatory system is of open type and put the waste products into. That is what is called the hind gut and from where they are being sent out through the anus. Now the hind gut. So when compared to the mid gut, it is somewhat broader. It is broader than broader than mid gut, <clears throat> and they differentiate into three components: ilium, colon, and rectum. The rectum opens outside. So three components in the hind gut, as seen in the picture: ilium, then we have colon and rectum, which opens outside. Now, what are the different glands associated with or connected with the digestive system? Now, we have normally one in the buccal cavity opens a pair of salivary glands. A pair of salivary glands in the form of mass. And from where actually the saliva is collected and stored in the reservoir or in the receptacle. And from where it is being sent out, the salivary ducts open at the base of what is called the hypopharynx or the tongue, the so-called tongue. So a pair of salivary glands which is secrete enzymes, particularly what we call the starch digesting enzyme amylase and invertase, otherwise called a sucrase or diastase. Invertase, another name for this one, diastase or sucrase. Concerned with the digestion of sucrose, that one is concerned with the digestion of starch and invertase, another name for sucrase. This is a common name. The one responsible for the breakdown of a sucrose, the sugar form in what we have in the cane, sugar cane. We can say simply what is called the cane sugar. So any enzyme name is given based on the nature of the substrate plus suffix ASE. For example, here sucrose is a sugar. Sucrose is a sugar ending with OS. See that one, sucrose. And the enzyme which is involved in breaking the sucrose is called sucrase. So OEC referring to the sugar, AEC referring to the enzyme that breaks the sugar. Lactose, the milk sugar. It is being broken by what we call lactase, the enzyme. Similarly, the maltose, the malt sugar found in the case of flour. That is a rice, wheat, flowers. And there you have maltase. So the suffix AEC referring to the enzyme. OAC referring to what is called the sugar name. Now, amylase, 
for storage digestion, invert is for sucrose digestion. Now hepatic CK. They also secret enzymes, having a mixture of enzymes for the digestion of proteins and carbohydrates. Now the glandular cells of the mesenteron found in the wall, they secrete the following enzymes. Maltase, invertase, trypsin and lipase. Now maltase is an enzyme which digests what is called maltose. Maltose. Simply called as malt sugar. Found in the case of you see that one. That is um, in malt. That is what we have. We can say the flavor of wheat. So it is a disaccharide formed from what is called the complex sugar starch. Starch is a polysaccharide, a complex sugar. It is being broken into maltose. This way it is called as a malt sugar, normally found in the flowers of wheat. The flowers of wheat. Just the broken one. That is a powdered one. The powder from the wheat, and the powder from what we have, that is the rice, is called flowers. And the flowers contain what we have, the maltose, otherwise called as a malt sugar. In what is I mentioned already, what we have, sucrose digesting enzyme. Trypsin is a protein digesting enzyme. Trypsin helps in the digestion of proteins. And lipase helps in the digestion of fat. As I mentioned earlier, the enzyme name is always ending with AC. Now here it is concerned the digestion of fat or lip lipid. So fats and their derivatives are called lipids. We are using the word lipid instead of fat. Fats and the derivatives are collectively called lipids. So the lipid digestive enzyme is called lipids. Now the protein digesting enzyme is called trypsin. Now this trypsin, you know that one, it is the oldest enzyme. There is a nickname for this trypsin, it is the oldest enzyme. Because it is the only enzyme present in all animals from amoeba to man. That's why it is called the oldest enzyme. It is the only enzyme present in all animals starting from amoeba up to man. Hence called the oldest enzyme of the body. There is a nickname for that. That question also, which one of the following is the oldest enzyme? We can get it in physiology digest system. Oldest enzyme. So these are the different enzymes for the digestion of, for example, starch, then maltose, and also we have the sucrose, the cane sugar, along with the protein digestion, and also for the lipid digestion. So this is what we have the physiology. Physiology actually concerned with the digestion of various materials by different glands. So we have the glands in the form of salivary glands, in the form of hepatic CK, and also we have the intestinal glands lining the wall of the intestine, secreting a group of enzymes, complex enzymes. Now about the circulatory system. Now in the case of cockroach, or generally in the case of arthropods, the circulatory system is normally of open type. It's of open type. All Arthropods, that means one of the examples of arthropods, we have the insect. So in the case of insect, the circulatory system is an open type. The meaning for that one, there are no blood vessels. There are no blood vessels. The blood is not flowing through the blood vessels. The blood is contained in the body cavity or it is stored in the body cavity. Such a body cavity is called hemosy. The blood filled body cavity is called hemosy. We have studied already in the case of arthropod or the general character. So that is system is called what is known as the open type of circulatory system. As a general rule, you know that one, if you take the circulatory system in the body also, we have the blood vessels, we have the heart, and then we have the blood, and then some muscles for pushing or just actually pumping the blood, associated with the heart. Here, we have the blood vessels are poorly developed. Only one or two blood vessels, that do not well developed. And then a blood, what is called a colorless blood, without any respiratory pigment, called hemolymph. Called hemolymph. But in other orthopods, in the case of crustaceans like prawn, crab, they have blue colored blood because of hemocyanin. But here the color is absent due to the absence of hemoglobin because hemoglobin has no role in the transport of oxygen. Blood is directly, actually you see that one oxygen is directly supplied to the tissues through the tracheal system or the respiratory system. Similarly, carbon dioxide is collected directly by what we have the tracheal system and itself what we have tracheal. So, there is no role played by the blood. The blood doesn't take part in what we have actually the respiratory process. 
Here the respiration is called as tissue respiration. That is what we have direct respiration. The meaning for direct respiration, oxygen is not carried by the blood, simply carried by a tube system, what is called the tracheal system concerned with the respiration to the tissues concerned and take away the carbon dioxide from the tissues to the exterior. So, here the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide doesn't take place through what we call the blood vessels as in our case. It is being transported only by means of a tube system, empty tube system. What is called the tracheal system, the tube system found in the case of cockroach, all insects. Now, the blood vessels are poorly developed. The blood is colorless, the blood, colorless blood of cockroach is called hemolytic. This is one first. What's the name of the colorless blood? Hemolytic. And we have actually a heart which is running all along the entire length of the body with the 13 chambers. 13 chambered muscular heart. For pumping the blood in the heart, associated with the heart, we have special type of muscles or are called allergy muscles. This is another question. So this is one question. The colorless blood of cockroach is called hemolytic, and then the muscles which help in what is called the circulation of blood or the movement of blood or the pumping of blood of the heart is allergy muscles. So allergy muscles are associated with the circulatory system of cockroach. This is the first allergy muscles and then colorless blood. Now, normally I mentioned small blood vessels, poorly developed blood vessels. They open into the hemocy. That is nothing but the body cavity filled with actually the body cavity filled with a colorless blood that is called hemocy. Now normally almost all the visceral organs are found in what we call the hemocy. They are being bothered by the blood. So visceral organs located in the hemocy are bothered in blood. They are floating. They are found in the hemocylic fluid. That is what we have the blood. They are not being isolated from the blood, they are formed in combination with the blood, they are being actually bathed in the blood. Now, if you are taking what we have the hemocyl, now in the structure I will show you. The entire hemocyl is being divided into two parts or two actually spaces. Now this is the dorsal region and this is the ventral region. Separated by a membrane, now this is a membrane, separated by a membrane. So the dorsal space filled with blood is called pericardial sinus. This is the dorsal space and this one pericardial sinus. The ventral region, the space is called what is known as perivisceral sinus. Now you see that one the various organs and organ systems are both only in the pericardial sinus filled with hemocylic fluid. So we have perivisceral sinus containing the various visceral organs. And what about the pericardial sinus? The pericardial sinus has the heart. So the heart is present just actually dorsally in the pericardial sinus. All the other visceral organs are formed in the perivisceral sinus ventrally. And these two spaces are being separated by means of a membrane. What we call this is a pericardial membrane. Now the pericardial membrane is provided with, you see that one, a number of walls, the space, you see that one. The pericardial sinus is in communication with the perivisceral sinus through these openings. These openings are guarded by the wall. These are all triangular, valvular openings. Now, the blood is normally moving from, this is the circulation, moving from the perivisceral sinus to the pericardial sinus. Even in the heart, through its length, if you are taking that one, the heart is more or less funnel shape. This is one chamber. 13 chambered heart, this is another chamber. See that one? The heart is more or less actually triangular. Now, here also in the heart wall, we have the openings. These are all the openings. These openings are called ostia. These openings are called ostia. So, the heart is 13 chambered, consisting of triangular structures with the valvular openings. Now the blood from the perivisceral sinus reaches the pericardial sinus and from the pericardial sinus through the valvular openings, here it is not mentioned, enters into the heart. So the movement of the blood is taking place in forward direction. At the anterior end in the head region it forms a small aorta, a small blood vessel which ends abruptly and from where the blood is returning to what we have actually perivisceral space. 
So perivisceral space, pericardial space, this is the movement of blood, the direction of flow of blood. From the pericardial space, passing through the pericardial membrane, the valvular openings reaching the pericardial sinus. Pericardial sinus. This is perivisceral space or perivisceral sinus. Sinus means the space. Pericardial sinus and through the valvular openings called ostium, the blood reaches what we call the heart. And because of the contraction of the muscles here, it is associated with what we call the alary muscles like this. The heart wall is connected to the alary muscles. The alary muscles are connected to the body wall. The alary muscles are connected to the body wall. So the alary muscles are responsible for the pumping of blood in the forward direction, in the forward direction, from posterior to anterior. At the anterior end only, just a small blood vessel, what is called aorta, a small blood vessel, and that one ends abruptly in the head region. So the blood is returning to the perivisceral sinus. So perivisceral sinus, pericardial sinus, then the heart, aorta, and finally the blood is returning to what we call the perivisceral sinus. So the blood is kept in circulation because of the contraction and relaxation of the muscle. The muscles called the alary muscles associated with what we call the circulatory system of the heart. So here you see that one perivisceral sinus, the lower one, the pericardial sinus, the upper one. This is a pericardial membrane separating these two. We have also the openings. Now this is a valve, the gate, which can be closed or open. But it allows the flow of blood only in one direction from the perivisceral sinus to the pericardial sinus. From where only the blood enters into the heart through the ostium. So this is what we have actually. Now, let's have the nose. Now the hemocell is divided into dorsal pericardial sinus and a ventral perivisceral sinus by means of a membrane, what is called pericardial membrane, which is very thin. So now the pericardium as seen in the picture is perforated by a number of actually small openings. These small openings are actually provided with the walls. And through which only the communication of blood takes place between the perivisceral and pericardial sinus. Perivisceral and pericardial sinus. Now this is the one what I mentioned earlier. The circulation is always kept in only one direction. Perivisceral sinus first. Then it is moving into the pericardial sinus through the valvular openings. And from the pericardial sinus to what we call the heart. And from the heart the blood reaches what we call the anterior part. A small blood vessel aorta and that ends abruptly, blindly in the head and from where the blood is once again returning to what we call the perivisceral sinus. So the blood is kept in circulation by the alary muscles connected to the lateral walls of the heart and to the body wall. Now the blood consists of colorless plasma, I mentioned that is a hemolymph and the cells what are called hemocytes which do not contain any pigment in them. That's why they are nothing to do with the respiration. They are not at all involved in the transport of what is called oxygen or carbon dioxide either from outside to the interior or to the tissues or from the tissues to the exterior. So respiration here is called as a tissue respiration and also it's called as a direct respiration. There is no involvement of the circulatory system. Now mainly it is concerned with, actually the function of the blood is concerned with the transport of nutrients and waste products transport of nutrients and waste products. So normally the waste product in cockroach is uric acid. You will see in the case of respiratory system. So that's about what we call the circulatory system. Now you can see in the picture. Now this is a 13 chambered heart. One, two like that. We have 13 chambered heart. This is a heart. And each one is called as a heart chamber. We have already started from here. Number one. Number two, like that, we have just, this is the second one, third one, third chambered heart. And at the anterior end, it ends in, actually, is followed by what is called aorta, which ends blindly in the head, and from where the blood is returning to the perivisceral sinus. Now, this is what we call the alary muscles. The triangular muscles, you can see that one, alary muscles, connected to the body bone. The contraction and relaxation of which are responsible for see that one, the pumping of the blood from, so the blood is moving in this direction, that is from posterior to anterior, not anterior to posterior. So the blood is circulating and pumped and then reaching the different organs of the body. This is the structure showing what we get the circulatory system.
Now I mentioned about the heart is a thirteen chamber. What is an elongated muscular tube present on the mid dorsal line of what we call the pericardial sinus? So the mid dorsal line of thorax and abdomen until length in the pericardial sinus. Now it is differentiated into thirteen funnel shaped, thirteen funnel shaped chambers, thirteen funnel shaped chambers. That is, that is actually said actually the heart is 13 chamber and out of this 13 3 are formed in the thoracic region and 10 formed in the abdominal region see that one 3 thoracic chambers and 10 abdominal chambers and having the opening what is called aster a pair of openings are present I showed in the picture now this is a heart heart chamber this is a heart chamber and now this is a triangular one so it is having what is called the opening, just right up present. So this is what we call the ostium, through which only the blood is entering. Now it is connected to the successive chamber. So the entry of blood into the heart is through what we call the ostium, the openings, the present on either side of each chamber, through which only the blood is entering. So anteriorly, you see that when the heart I mentioned earlier is continued into a slender tube, the aorta. From where the blood is reaching to once again the pericardial sinus. Now the pericardial membrane, suppose it's the pericardial membrane, what we have seen. Now you see that when this is the pericardial membrane, this is the extension of the muscles, what we call the alary muscles. This is what we call the extension of the muscles, the alary muscles, extending from the pericardial membrane to the lateral body part. And that one is responsible for the what is called the pumping of the blood. Now, what I represent is nothing but the alley. This is the alley muscle. Alley muscles. In picture. So we have actually until it is continued as the aorta. So the pericardial membrane is provided with a series of triangular pad alley muscles. What I showed now. And also in the picture and also what I drew, triangular pod alary muscles which help in circulation, help in circulation by contraction and relaxation. So blood from the pericardial sinus enters the heart through ostium and is pumped anteriorly into the perivisceral sinus again. So I mentioned the perivisceral sinus, then pericardial sinus and through the ostium the blood reaches the heart, the heart is running actually anteriorly there it ends in aorta from where the blood is returning to the perivisceral sinus. Now the respiratory system. So the respiration is affected by the tracheal system. In the case of cockroach, a terrestrial animal having the tracheal system. So for communication on the lateral sides we have some openings. They are called the stigmata or spherical. So we have three components in the respiratory system. One, stigmata or spiracles. A system of tubes, what is called trachea, and the trachea is branched into many minute branches, and each branch ends in a single cell, and that cell is called as a tracheal cell. So we have spiracles or stigmata, a tracheal system in the form of tubes, and a single cell connected to each and every cell. That is called the tracheal. Now the spiracles are stigmata. Now we have 10 pairs of openings are present on the lateral side of the body, on the lateral side. And two of them are present in the thoracic region, one in the mesothorax, another one in the metathorax. The remaining eight pairs are present laterally in the abdominal side. So 10 pairs of stigmata or 10 pairs of spiracles are present. Now 10 pairs of spiracles. Now two pairs, what I mentioned earlier, in the first two pairs in the visothoracic and metathoracic segments, one pair each. The remaining eight pairs are present in the first eight abdominal segments, third, fourth, fifth, like that one. The tenth one is found in the eighth abdominal segment, through which only air is drawn and is given out. So I mentioned about the remaining eight pairs are present in the first eight abdominal segments. Now, actually, if you are taking what we have I mentioned about, the spiracles, two pairs in the thoracic region and eight pairs in the abdomen. So all the spiracles are functional. 
and such a type of tracheal system is called holonistic system holonistic system or holonistic structural sorry the tracheal system holonistic system or holonistic tracheal system the meaning for that one all openings all we have the spiracles are functional in some cases you know that one only some spiracles are functional and others are non functional though present in the body of insect but here all the 10 spiracles are functional helping in respiration such a type of tracheal system is called holonistic tracheal system holonistic tracheal system now they are present on the lateral sides of the body i mentioned about it and each spiracle leads into a small chamber what is called atrium from which arises we have a number of tracheal tubes which are branch branch and then leading to what is called the tissues through what we call the tracheal cell so each spiracle leads into a small chamber called atrium now you see that for the opening of the spiracle either to close or open the opening of the spiracle is regulated by certain actually muscular structures present at the junction of the opening also and these are all nothing but what we call the sphincter muscles so see that one the opening of the spiracles is regulated by according to the nature of the animal's requirement of oxygen by means of sphincter muscles present at the opening junctions tracheae now i mentioned there is a small chamber from which a system of tubes arises what is called several tubes called tracheae runs inside so there are two major trunks vertically and the lateral branches also there and they are together forming what is called the tracheal system now the tracheal system the branches enter into an organ end in a special cell so we have the trachea suppose we are taking for example this is what we have the spiracle i'm taking the body wall this is a spiracle the stigmata then we have the space this is what is called atrium and from which arises you see that one the branches now this is atrium this part atrium the space from which we have either the lateral branches or we have the vertical branches arise now these are all branching into small tubes and each branch ends in a cell this is what's called a tracheal cell tracheal cell tracheal cell this is the tracheal cell filled with the fluid here is the organ concern now exchange of materials taking place there is a gas is takes place between the fluid present in the tracheal cell and the tissue or the cell by diffusion process so in that manner now the oxygen is supplied to the tissues directly and carbon dioxide is removed directly from the cells that's why the system is called i mentioned about what we call that is a direct respiration in direct respiration there is no involvement of blood because of the absence of respiratory pigment it is a tracheal system that is normally running and supplying actually the various components like gases to the cells there is components like oxygen is supplied and carbon dioxide is removed now the innermost actually before that one now all tracheal branches entering in organ end in a special cell what is called tracheal cell now we have if you are taking the trachea it has an outer layer and an inner layer outer layer is called eczema and inner layer is called intima now the intima is produced in many thickenings it is produced in many thickenings as in the case of for example trachea of man we have the trachea that is supported with what we have ring shaped cartilaginous bones but here we have the trachea which is supported by ring like thickenings produced by the innermost layer of trachea what is called intima these thickenings which is support the wall of trachea and preventing it from collapsing is called tenedia this is nothing but the chitinous thickening which is support what is called the wall of the trachea and preventing the trachea from collapse and that is called tenedia so the innermost layer of trachea is called intima it is produced in the spiral thickenings called tenedia all around the tracheal wall prevent the trachea from collapse so what is tenedia the chitinous thickenings present on the wall of a trachea now tracheal cell 
I mentioned already it is a terminal structure, made up of only one cell, a single cell having cytoplasm and nucleus, filled with the fluid. An exchange of gases takes place between the fluid of tracheal and what we call the cytoplasm of the cell directly. Now, exchange of gases takes place at the tracheals by diffusion. The gases enters into the fluid of the tracheal, just for example carbon dioxide by diffusion, and similarly from the fluid. Now oxygen diffuses into the tissue or cell. So anyway, now the tracheal system consists of the spiracles of 10 pairs, the tube system that is normally transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide either to in or out. And at the terminal end, it ends in what we have a single cell, what is called tracheal. That is a unit and through which only the exchange of gas is possible between the cell and the tracheal system by means of diffusion because the tracheal cell is filled with the fluid. Oxygen from the fluid reaches the cells and carbon dioxide from the cells normally reaches the tissue fluid, sorry, the fluid formed in the case of tracheal. Now mechanism of respiration. Now normally you know we have external respiration. What is the meaning for external respiration? Now the exchange of gases between the lungs and what we call the outer medium. This is called external respiration. That is exchange of gases between the lungs and what we call the external environment. But that kind of external respiration is absent in the case of a cockroach. So the external respiration which takes in respiratory gases to the respiratory organs is absent. There are no respiratory organs in the form of lungs. So there is no ventilation is possible, there is no breathing is possible. So that is called external respiration. Exchange of gases between the lungs and the external environment is called external respiration. But again there is no external respiration as the lungs are absent. Directly the gas enters, no breathing, it is moving in and moving out, reaching the organs concerned. Now inspiration. So two events happening during what is called the respiratory process as in the case of human beings, we to have two events. One is called inspiration, taking enough oxygen rich air into the lungs. And it is an active process in the case of human beings. It is brought about by you know that one, the diaphragm muscles and also intercostal muscles of what we call the ribs. In our case, diaphragm and we have external and internal intercostal muscles take part. Here, now this is inspiration is taking enough gases into what is called the body, it is because of a muscle, what is called pergosternal muscles. Muscles connecting the pergum plate, the dorsal plate, and we have the sternum plate, the ventral plate, and that muscle is called pergosternal muscles. Okay, here you see that one, pergosternal muscles. During inspiration, what is happening, the relaxation of these muscles are taking place. The muscles undergo relaxation. No energy is being spent, hence called a passive process. It is in contrast to human being. In human being normally, it is an active process. Inspiration is an active process. But here it is a passive process, no energy is being spent. So it is brought about by the relaxation of pterygosternal muscles. Now the expiration. It is a passive process normally in our case, but it is an active process. Okay. Now this is, in the case of inspiration, it is a passive process. In the case of expiration, it is an active process. But in our case, it is passive process and that one is active process. Contrast one. Now here the first one is caused by the relaxation of the pterygosternal muscles and here it is caused by the contraction of pterygosternal muscles. The same muscles, in one stage it is undergoing what is called contraction, in another stage it is undergoing relaxation. So during expression, it undergoes relaxation. That is why it doesn't require energy. That is why it is called as passive process. Sorry, it requires, I made a mistake. Now in the case of inspiration, does it require energy. So it is actually a passive process. Now in the case of expression, it is an active process during which the contraction of the muscles occur. And the process needs energy. Just opposite to the top. So in our case, inspiration is an active process and the expression is a passive process. But here, inspiration is a passive process and expiration is an active process. Both being brought about by the same muscle, what is called pergosternal muscles, either by relaxation or by contraction. 
Now explain. So the process of elimination of waste materials from the body, particularly the nitrogenous waste products, is called excretion. It is different from what we call defecation or ejection. In defecation or ejection, only the waste products formed at the end of digestion are eliminated through the anus. So excretion is a process in which the nitrogenous waste products, either ammonia or urea or uric acid, any type of nitrogenous waste product is eliminated. It's all what is known as excretion. Here in the case of cockroach, the organ involved in excretion of malphagian tubules, I mentioned already, they are worn 100 to 150 yellow colored thread-like structures present at the junction of the midgut and hindgut. So, their main function, so they have what is called glandular cells. Now, internally, they are concerned or lined with glandular cells and ciliated cells. For driving, the ciliated cells are used. The glandular cells for secretion of the waste products. Now, the main function of these tubules, they are floating in the silomic fluid, what we can say, the blood, the colorless blood. It collects the waste products in the form of uric acid. It collects the waste products if anything is there and converting that one into uric acid. So, uric acid is one of the adaptations, you know that one, to prevent the loss of water. To prevent the loss of water. It is concerned with the water conservation process. That's why the birds, you know that one, they excrete uric acid. The reptiles excrete uric acid. A process of conservation of water. An adaptation to the terrestrial animals. Now, they absorb the nitrogenous waste products from the silomic fluid, what we have the blood, and converting them into uric acid. Now that waste product is now excreted through the anus of the hindgut because they are being released. Now the filamentous structures collect the waste products, converting them into uric acid and put it into the lumen of the hindgut from where it is being eliminated through. That is also the anus. As now the cockroach eliminates uric acid as waste product, now they are also called actually uricotelic and so the animals are classified based on the nature of the waste product they excrete or eliminate. So uricotelic animals like reptiles, birds and insects, reptiles, birds and insects, all these animals excrete only uric acid. That's why they are called uricotelic animals. So question is which one of the following is a uricotelic animal? One, this is cockroach or simply we can say in the form of insects. All insects are uricotelic. Then we have reptiles. All reptiles, the lizards, snakes, turtles and tortoises and all birds. So this is one question, just in the question paper. They are given three options. Which one of the falling animal, in which one of the falling animal, uric acid is not excreted. They are given these three options, insects, reptiles and birds. And the last one, they are given the option spider. So a spider doesn't excrete, you know that when uric acid, it excretes what we call warning. So this is a common character for these three animals. Insects, reptiles and birds all excrete what we call the uric acid or excrete the uric acid. This is a common character. So all these are all uricotelic animals. Now what are the other structures concerning the excretion in the case of this animal? Some structures, for example, the fat body, some of the excrete waste product. The nephrocytes as cells, as they are secretory and excrete in function, they are called nephrocytes. And also some glands also present small mass of glands called uricose glands. So they are also secreted or excreted, the base products are excreted also with the fat body, the uricose glands and also become what is called just the nephrocytes. Nephrocytes as they are collecting the waste, they are called nephrocytes. So fat body, nephrocytes and also uricose glands. These are all concerned with what we call excretion. So that is about the excretory process. Then we have to go for the nervous system. So I will take a few minutes break. We will come back once again to continue the lesson. Okay.